السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين. والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين. نحمد الله حمدا يليق بجلال قدره ونور وجهه وعظمة ملكه وعدد خلقه. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له. وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. Who praise Allah the Almighty. Um, I uh, bear witness that there is no deity but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the true messenger and servant of uh, Allah. Dear brothers and sisters, <clears throat> today we're going to be talk, continue our uh, discussion about uh, the companions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about one of the, one of the giants of the, of the followers, inshallah. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about Umar uh, al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Uh, we are going to go over his uh, pedigree, uh, his, his parents, his birth, uh, his life before Islam, his life during Islam, and his accomplishments and contributions to the, uh, to the, to the state of Islam. Um, as we all know, Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu is considered one of the, uh, 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 one of the uh, most gracious uh, companions of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and he is the second true founder of, of the state of Islam after Prophet peace be upon him and uh, of course uh, Abu Bakr uh, and uh, we're going to start about talking about his name and his pedigree basically so his name is Umar ibn Khattab ibn Fayl ibn Abdul Azza ibn Riyah ibn Abdullah ibn Qat and it goes back all the way to Quraysh and uh, he meets with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, in the uh, grandfather of Ka'b ibn Mu'ayy. So they share the same, the same grandfather, Ka'b ibn Mu'ayy. Uh, his nickname is, he's got two nicknames, Abu Hafs, and his other nickname is al Farooq. Uh, I will talk about uh, why he was called al Farooq later on. But Abu Hafs, his nickname, that nickname was given to him by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the reason for that, for that is that uh, his oldest child was Hafsa, anha, the wife of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, gave him the nickname Abu Hafs. Um, as far as his description, uh, Umar al-Khattab, uh, some people said that he was light, he had light complexion. Some people said he was between white to dark complexion. And some people said he used to have white complexion. But because of, of the year of uh, uh, Ramadan, which is the year of the famine, because of the drought and the heat, his complexion turned a little darker. Uh, so they, 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 they were not uh, in agreement on the, on the color of his complexion, but they said that he had some relish in his face. Uh, uh, he said that uh, he had uh, good cheeks, he had uh, strong build, and he had broad shoulders, he had bald head, and he was extremely tall. I mean, you can you can point him while standing with Sahaba because they said if he's if they were like Sahaba gathered together and Omar was with him, you would think that he's riding a horse as as he was standing among Sahaba. And some people said that when he rode his horse, sometimes if the horse is not big enough, sometimes his legs uh, or his feet would drag uh, on the on the ground. That's how tall he was. He's very tall. Um, he had a long beard, he usually dyed his beard with henna, and he had a, a long mustache also. And uh, he, was, he was known of that every time he would think about a problem, trying to solve a puzzle, he would, he would, like, he would tweak his, his, the size of his mustache, he was known to doing that. Um, he was also left-handed, and some people said he, he was left-handed and right-handed, so he was able to use both his hands, but uh, opinions vary about, about that. Um, this is basically uh, his, his, uh, his basic uh, description. Uh, about his mother, uh, his mother's name is Hantama bint Hashim ibn Mughira ibn Makhzum. Uh, she is the cousin of uh, Umm Salama radiallahu anha, the uh, wife of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. That was, that's her cousin. She is also the cousin of Khalid ibn Walid, his mom. And she's also the cousin of Amr ibn Hisham, uh, also known as Abu Jahl. She meets in pedigree with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in uh, uh, grandfather Kilab ibn Murrah. 
So they're also related. And let's not forget, they're all from Quraysh. And then you know, they, they all meet, meet in, in certain pedigree with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, as far as his birth goes, uh, he was born after the year of the elephant. And they say he was born uh, 13 years after uh, the birth of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So he was much younger than Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it's known that he used to live in a mountain, one of the, one of the mountains in Mecca. And that mountain used to, was known as Al-Aqir. And it was later on known as uh, the mountain of Omar. As you all know, he was raised in Quraysh. Uh, he was very smart and he knew how to read, which was very rare at, at that time. You notice even that uh, Arab poets, people that used to write poetry, they did not know how to read or write. So that was that was a really unique uh, feature, his ability to be able to read. Uh, he also learned how to wrestle. He learned how uh, the art of horse riding and he learned poetry. Um, it was told that uh, when he was young, uh, he used to uh, shepherd camels for his dad and his aunts, and it was told that his dad was very harsh on him growing up. Uh, Omar al-Khattab, as I said, he was, he was a very smart person, and he used to attend uh, the Arab fairs and Arab festivals. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but uh, once a year, the Arabs used to hold like uh, a big festival, like, like uh, the festival of uh, Kals. Basically, they would all meet and they would like uh, talk about poetry, they would exchange ideas, they would talk about different topics. So Omar al-Khattab um, used to attend these uh, festivals, and through those festivals, he knew the art of trade. He became a very successful merchant, and he became very rich. He would become one of the richest people in Mecca because, because of that. Uh, as a result, he was able to travel to, uh, to uh, Levant, which is the area of Palestine, also right now as Palestine, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon. He traveled there during the, the, the summer, and he traveled to Yemen during winter. And he was mentioned in, in mentioned the Quran, Surah Quraysh. Omar al Khattab was also one of the chiefs and one of the honorable men in Mecca. If you recall, in our uh, previous lecture, we talked about there was like 10 honorable men in Mecca, uh, including Omar al Khattab, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, uh, Al-Abbas, uh, Khad al-Walid, Abu Sufyan. Each one was assigned a task. Each one was known to, for something. And uh, Omar al-Khattab, who was known as the ambassador of Quraysh, so basically, he was the representative of Quraysh. If Quraysh wanted to, to introduce itself to another tribe, they would send Omar al-Khattab. If they wanted to, to have a treaty with another tribe, they, they used to send Omar al-Khattab to represent uh, them. And when he, during Jahiliyyah, he was fond of wine and women. That was, of course, during Jahiliyyah. So, growing up, uh, in, in the Jahiliyyah and you know, following the footsteps of his uncles, uh, he was you know, he used to worship idols as, as, as we know. And uh, then Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, started to uh, talk to people about Islam. As we know, the first three years of Dawah, it used to be in secret, so this lasted for about uh, three years. And then when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, announced the religion of Islam and start to uh, openly talk about Islam and asking people to join Islam. We all know that Quraysh's reaction was extreme and they used to torture uh, weak Muslims very badly and they used to harass them. And uh, Omar was one of the biggest enemies uh, to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, at that time. Uh, he, used, he used to have a uh, female slave that embraced Islam and he was told that he used to torture her from, from sunrise to sunset. And he would only let go of her because out of boredom. He would say, I swear to God, I'm letting you go because I'm just bored. He's, he's just torturing her day and night because he hated Islam so much. It got to the, to the point where Omar who used to follow Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. As Prophet Muhammad used to go around and talk to people about Islam, uh, uh, Omar al-Khattab used to, once Prophet Muhammad peace would be done, Omar al-Khattab used to go to that same person and uh, threaten them and tell them that not to follow Islam and try to deter them from following Islam. And 
we all know that this continued for a long time, the harassment of Muslims and the animosity uh, for quite some time. And then Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave his followers permission to go to uh, uh, Abyssinia and, uh, and, and to, 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 to get away from, from, the, uh, from the cruelty of uh, Quraysh. And uh, when Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, ordered that and people start to uh, uh, migrate, Omar bin Khattab saw that as a threat to the unity of Quraysh because he's saying, okay, well, people of Quraysh are migrating and this is breaking the unity and the foundation of Quraysh. And he got to the point where he thought about uh, killing Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, more than once, several times. So under under this, this harsh personality, this toughness, um, Omar al-Khattab, under all that, he had he had soft heart. Uh, and I'm just going to share like a little story about this. Uh, it is said that Omar al-Khattab, he was walking in Mecca, and he saw the wife of uh, a Sahabi called, 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 called Amir ibn Rabia. And he saw her uh, prepping for uh, to migrate out of Mecca. And he asked her to confirm that, and she told him that she's uh, migrating, and he told her, "May God be with you." She felt sincerity in his in his in his in his language and his in his body language. So she told her husband about that. But you know, her husband knows that Omar is a tough guy. He's one of the biggest enemies. He told her, "You know what? Omar will not embrace Islam until the donkey of Omar embraces Islam." You know, that is like that's there's no way he's going to become a Muslim. And we have to understand that during this time, you know, due to the fact that uh, Omar al-Khattab used to travel a lot, he met different people from different backgrounds, and he interacted with different religions, he was having a psychological struggle between Islam and the lifestyle of his, of his parents and his grandparents and his tribe. Because Omar was a very smart person, and to him Islam made sense. But he had this inner conflict between Islam and the lifestyle of Jahiliyyah. And Omar al-Khattab used to analyze things and say, you know what, Muhammad, peace be upon him, one of his nicknames is the truthful, the honest. He was never known to tell a lie. And why would he lie about this? He also knows that Quraysh offered Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to be a king. They told him, you know, we'll give you whatever you want to let go of this religion. If you want to be a king, we'll make you a king. If you want to be rich, we will make you rich, we'll gather our money and give it to you. If you want women, we will, we will, we will, we will uh, look for the best woman in Christ and have you marry her. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, refused to do that. And he kept thinking, why would he do that? You know, if he was after life, after dunya, why would he do that? It has to be something greater than this. And this conflict continued to, to, to simmer uh, in, in, uh, within his personality. Another thing that, that got him want to wonder is that they uh, practiced all kinds of torture on the followers of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and not a single one of them uh, turned away from Islam. So this was puzzling also to him. What, what, would you, what would you hold on to this religion if it's causing you so much pain and so much suffering? On the other, on the other hand, he was one of the most honorable people in Quraysh. He was the ambassador. He had, was high in, 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 uh, uh, he had a high ranking in the society of Quraysh. And this, this struggle continued to happen. And then an incident happened. Um, you know that Amr ibn Hisham Abu Jahl is Amr al Khattab's uncle. And there was an altercation between uh, Abu Jahl and Hamza, where Hamza uh, uh, hit Abu Jahl because Abu Jahl insulted Prophet Muhammad. And he hit Prophet Muhammad and declared that he's a Muslim. So this kind of had like, he, he, this injured the pride of Omar because his uncle was also insulted. So all of this was boiling and he's saying this is happening, uh, the community is getting divided, there's no reason, there's no way to deal with Muhammad until I kill Muhammad, peace be upon him. So what happened, he sharpened, one day he sharpened his sword and he, uh, he held his sword and he walked away on, his, on, on the streets of Mecca with his sword. And as he was walking, a Sahabi by the name of Nuaim ibn Abdullah uh, al-Adawi. He, uh, 
He was he was secretly a Muslim, but he was he was one of the weak Muslims, so he couldn't just say I'm a Muslim, so he kept it secret. And he looked at the body language of Omar. Omar looked very upset and very serious, and he knew Omar was up to no good. And he told Omar, "Where are you going?" And Omar told him, "I'm going to go look for Muhammad. I'm going to kill him." And uh, he told Omar, he told him, "Do you think that the the uh, uh, family of Muhammad uh, Al Abbanaf, if you kill him, do you think they're going to let you walk free? They're going to kill you." So he started to deter him from doing that. And Omar was very smart, and he kind of suspected that the Sahabi is Muslim. So he asked him, "Are you Muslim?" So the Sahabi, I mean Omar, was like a scary person. He feared for his life, and he told him, "Why don't you go straight now to your house before you you, you ask people, people before you judge people?" He told him. So Omar asked him, "What do you mean?" And he told him, "Well, your sister Fatima and her husband, husband, husband Sa'id ibn Zayd, they embraced Islam, and Sa'id ibn Zayd is is uh, 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 also the cousin of Omar bin Khattab." So now Omar Khattab is extremely upset, extremely mad, and instead of going to the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he decided to go to the house of, of, his, uh, of his sister and her husband. Now, when this was happening, there was a Sahabi by the name of Khabbab ibn al -Arad. He was He was in the house of Fatima. Uh, remember Fatima, this is Fatima, the sister of Omar al Khattab. He was in, in, the, in the house of Fatima, uh, reciting the uh, uh, Surah of Taha. See, back then, every time a new Surah uh, descends on Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Sahaba would be so excited. They would try to write that on a piece of paper and they would go and share it and read it. So he was he was gathered with, with uh, Fatima and uh, Sa'id, and he was reciting that when they heard the knock on the door and heard Omar. Omar's voice. And again, Omar put fear in people's hearts because of his character, his size, his personality, his seriousness. So Khabbab hid in, in one of the rooms, and Fatima took that piece of paper and she folded it and she put it under her thigh as she was sitting. So Omar entered and he told him, I heard whispering, what were you talking about? And he did not answer. And then uh, Said, Omar told him, I heard that you embraced Islam. And Said told him, What if your religion is wrong, Omar? And that was an indication that he did embrace Islam. So Omar, being so angry, he uh, knocked Said uh, down and jumped on him and started to punch, punch, uh, punch him, which caused Fatima also to, to run and try to separate them. And she was very upset because Omar was beating up her husband for no reason. And then she told him that she is a Muslim and she said Shahada. And this got Omar even more upset. And he hit her so hard he split her face. And at that time he saw the, the piece of paper. And he told her, What's in that paper? And she told him it's it's a it's a, a surah of the Quran and he wanted to read it. And she told him you can't touch it because you're not a Muslim, you have to do uh, ablution first. So he went, he washed himself, he came back, and he looked at the at the Surah Taha, and he read where it says, and I'm going to read this uh, as it says it in this uh, translation. It says, Taha, we have not sent down to you the Quran that you be stressed, but only as a reminder for those who fear Allah. A revelation from he who created the earth and the highest heavens the most merciful, who is above the throne established. To him belongs what is in the heavens and what is on the earth and what is uh, between them and what is under the soul, the soil. And if you speak aloud, then indeed he knows the secret and what is even more hidden. Allah, there is no deity except him to whom belongs the best names. Now this is of course a translation if you read it in Arabic, it is very solid, very strong words. And Omar read this and he said, wow, these words are beautiful. You know, He felt something in his heart. And he told, uh, he told, uh, and at the time, Khabab al-Arad came out. 
And he told Khabbab, take me to Muhammad. And where is Muhammad? And he told him that Muhammad is in a place called uh, Dar al-Arqab ibn al-Arqam, the place of someone called uh, al-Arqab ibn al-Arqam, with his followers. So at this point, Umar al-Khattab was walking quickly towards that place, and he, he had his sword with him. And as he arrived, he knocked on the door, and at the time, the Sahaba were, were all together, and Hamza was amongst the Sahaba. And they, they looked through the, 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 the hole in the, in, the, in the door, and they saw Umar. And they ran to Prophet Muhammad and told him, it's Umar, and he has his sword with him. And they were afraid that Umar was going to, to attack Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And then, just a good example about Hamza, he called Asadullah, the Lion of God, Hamza. And he told him, so be it. What if it is Umar? If he came in peace, we, we, we'll welcome him. What we are, we're going to welcome him. And if he, if he came to fight, we're going to kill him with his sword. So they let Prophet Muhammad told him, let him in. So they let Umar in, and Prophet Muhammad did not hide behind, hide behind his, his followers, no. He was the first one to go towards Omar. And Omar is saying that Prophet Muhammad approached him, grabbed him by his clothes, and shook him several times. And he told him, isn't it about time you embrace Islam? And Prophet Muhammad, this one was also very strong. And Omar told him, I swear by God, I only came here to embrace Islam. And he said, Shahada. And when he said Shahada, Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, uh, made takbir, Allahu Akbar. And so did the Sahaba. And it's Prophet Muhammad, the only person that Prophet Muhammad did takbir for was Omar when he, when he embraced Islam because Prophet Muhammad was so happy that uh, Omar uh, joined Islam because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made a supplication uh, before Omar joined. He, he, was, he used to tell God, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, God, please honor Islam by uh, either one of the Omars, meaning either Omar bin Khattab or Amr bin Hisham, Abu Jihad. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered his supplication and Omar embraced Islam because of Prophet Muhammad's uh, supplication. So, now once Omar became a Muslim, the, the Muslims felt very strong. They felt very honored because it's Omar and he became a Muslim. And they did not feel weak anymore. And they felt proud to be Muslims. And it happened one day that uh, Muslims, because they felt weak, they used to do their prayers on the outskirts of Mecca. And uh, Amr al-Khattab al asked Prophet Muhammad, he asked him, are we not righteous? Prophet Muhammad said, yes, we are. And Omar said, why are we hiding our Islam? And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, well, Omar, what do you want? He told him, let's march to Kaaba to Tawaf and uh, show everybody that we are Muslims. And Prophet Muhammad agreed to it. So the Muslims, uh, let me back up a little bit. When, when Omar embraced Islam, uh, it was uh, year five after mission, after the mission of Prophet Muhammad. So Prophet Muhammad was calling for Islam for five years and, and Omar declared, uh, became Muslim on the fifth year of the mission. And he was the 40th Sahabi to, to embrace Islam. So like 39 Sahabis before him, he was number 40. And he declared Islam three days after Hamza. So they split the Muslims into two lines. One line was led by Hamza, and one line was led by Omar, and they marched to Kaaba, and they did takbir, and they did tawaf. And when the disbelievers saw Omar bin Khattab and Hamza heading the two lines, no one dared to say anything. They kept quiet as the Muslims uh, did tawaf and, 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 and takbir uh, inside the Kaaba. So that just tells you about Umar al-Khattab, his, his personality, his character. He was feared by, by, by his enemies and he was respected by the ones who loved him. So this continued to happen and the Muslims, as we all know, continued to be tortured. And we all know about the story of, uh, of Hijrah when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, uh, gave permission to his followers to, to migrate to Al-Madinah after they had a, 
uh, an alliance with the Ansar. And of course, Quraysh, they're not dumb. They, they know that this was a red flag. They didn't want uh, uh, the, the Muslims to have a stronghold in Medina and to, 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 to create alliances with, with people. This will make them strong. So they start to prevent Muslims from, from going to Medina, either by torture, by intimidation, by any means possible. So a lot of Muslims used to, to immigrate to Medina by secret. They wouldn't tell them, but secretly they would just go. Except for Omar It was known that when Omar decided to, to, to migrate to, uh, to Medina, he, uh, he put his sword on, he, uh, he uh, attached his bow to his back, and he had uh, like a stick with him. He walked to Al Kaaba, he did tawaf for seven times, he prayed two rakats, and he stood up and he told the disbelievers, he told them, he who wishes his mother to weep on him, to weep him, and he who wishes his son to be an orphan is to meet me behind this valley. I'm going to migrate. And no one followed him, no one tried to stop him, and he ended up to going to Mecca. And he was told that when he, uh, to Medina, sorry. And when he arrived to Medina, he had 20 of his of his family members uh, with him, like Zayd al Khattab, which is his brother, Amr wa Abdullah, uh, uh, the sons of Sulaq ibn Malik, and Sa'id ibn Sa'id, and others. When uh, Amr left in Medina, of course, uh, Prophet, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon did what we call brotherhood. You know, he, he paired every two Muslims, and they make he made them brothers, and they would share everything together. And it was told that Abu Bakr was the brother of Islam uh, to Omar. Some other scholars say it's Awaim ibn Sa'idah, and some others say it's Mu'ad ibn Afra. Uh, it's not known yet. It's unknown, but uh, those are the possibilities. Um, as we know, the, the life of, uh, of Muslims in Medina was quite different than the life of Muslims in Mecca, because in Mecca, uh, everything was done in secret. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to establish a solid foundation for the, Muslim, for the Muslims so they have a good, uh, a good strong faith. But once, once they moved to Medina, things have changed because now they have a state in Medina. Now uh, the Quran uh, was instructing Muslims on how to create a, a state, a state affair. And as a result of that, of course, without the alliance, we, we know that the, the believers uh, declared war on Prophet Muhammad and there were bunch of, more than one battle between Muslims and uh, and the disbelievers, and uh, Amr al-Khattab he witnessed all the, the battles of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He uh, witnessed the battle of, uh, of Badr, and he was one of the people who spoke after Sayyidina Abu Bakr uh, that tell Prophet Muhammad that I support you, and tell Prophet Muhammad that you should fight back. Uh, he killed his uncle Al-As in the battle of, uh, of Badr also. Um, he was also one of the few followers that stood by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, during the Battle of Uhud, when Prophet Muhammad was injured and uh, he was surrounded by the disbelievers. He's one of the few that stood, uh, stood solid and defended Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, of course, he was present during the, the conquest of Mecca in the year 630. And he also performed a pilgrimage with Prophet Muhammad in the year 631, which is the last, the last pilgrimage of Prophet Muhammad in Hajjat al-Wada. And let's not forget that uh, the daughter of Omar, Radiallahu Hafsa Radiallahu was, you know, married to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. She met Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the year 625 uh, AD. Uh, at the year 632 AD, uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, passed away. And we, we've talked about the incident uh, in the previous lecture because Sayyidina Omar was, was he loved Prophet Muhammad so much, he was in denial and he threatened to kill anybody who would say Prophet Muhammad had uh, passed away. And we know the story when uh, Abu Bakr made his famous speech and he recited the Quran, Surah the Quran, uh, which says, And Muhammad is nothing but a messenger. Messengers have passed away before him. So if he dies or is killed, will you turn back on your heels? And whoever turns back on his heels will not harm God at all, and God will reward the thankful. And when Omar al Khattab heard these words, he say he kneeled down and he, he just he was weeping because he was so sad that uh, he uh, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him departed this this world. 
And as we talked in the last, in the previous lecture, when Prophet Muhammad peace be upon passed away, there was a little discussion about who is going to be the leader of the Muslim, who's going to be Khalifa. And one of the one of the one of the uh, good good things that Omar peace be upon Omar Adhan did is that, as you recall, when when everybody when the voices were loud, everybody was discussing. Uh, uh, Omar Adhan told Abu Bakr, extend your arm. He held his arm and he told, I pledge allegiance to you. And then all the Muslims followed, and then the Muslims uh, pledged, pledged allegiance to Abu Bakr as Siddiq. So this was the mark of a new era in, 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 the, in the Muslim history when, you know, for the first time, you know, the Prophet is no longer there, peace be upon him, and then Abu Bakr became Khalifa. So what did Abu Bakr do? What, did Umar, what was Umar's role when Abu Bakr became Khalifa? So Umar al-Khattab played very big roles. Uh, when he was uh, uh, under the Khilafat uh, uh, Abu Bakr of the Iran. He was the assistant uh, of Abu Bakr, he was the minister, and he was the war uh, warfare consultant of Abu Bakr of the Iran. And Abu Bakr said that no one on the surface of earth is more loved to me than Omar. Uh, also, Abu Bakr used to consult Omar about who is to lead the army, and he used to listen to, to Omar's opinion. It is noted that uh, uh, Abu Bakr al appointed a Sahabi by the name of Sa'id uh, ibn al As to head the army hidden for uh, the event. But uh, when Omar objected to that, Abu Bakr uh, removed uh, uh, Sa'id from, from, uh, from leading the army because he, he devalued the opinion of Omar al Khattab. Um, as we all know about the history of Islam, uh, after the passing of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, a lot of people turned away from Islam. And uh, as we talked in the, in the last last uh, lecture, uh, there were like three different people who turned away from three different types. Uh, some people, they refused to give zakat. Some people start to return to the, to the worship of idols. And some people start to follow false uh, prophets. And Abu Bakr was of the opinion that we need to fight, fight them all, unite the, the peninsula, and uh, unite Islam. So one of, the, one of the toughest battles was the battle of Yamama, with those who turned away from Islam. And during that battle, it's estimated that 500 to 700 people who have memorized the Quran passed away. So 500 to 700 people that memorized the Quran passed away. And when Omar knew about that, he, he showed a lot of concern because, again, he was he was a visionary man. He was a very smart person. He said, you know, if if more of those people die, what's going to happen to the Quran? So he went to Abu Bakr and told him, suggested to Abu Bakr to gather the Quran, you know, to gather the Quran, to write the Quran and put it in like in like one one book. And Abu Bakr was very hesitant to do that. Because he told Omar, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him never did that. So he was hesitant to do something that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him did not do. But Omar was very persistent and he convinced Abu Bakr that it is a good idea. So Abu Bakr uh, assigned a, uh, one of the followers called, uh, I believe his, his name was uh, Zayd ibn Thabit. Uh, yes, Zayd, Zabit, uh, Zayd ibn Thabit, he assigned him this task. And, uh, then the then Sabbath then said that, uh, I swear to God, had you told me to move mountains, it would have been an easier task for me because it was a huge responsibility. And then after that, the Quran was, was gathered as, as in, in one book, and it was, it was saved. Um, one of the accomplishments of uh, Omar al-Khattab during the era of, of uh, Abu Bakr is that he was assigned uh, as a judge. He was, he was a judge uh, during the era of uh, Abu Bakr. He was a judge for one year, and then he resigned. And when Abu Bakr asked him, why did you resign? And he told him that for this one year, he did not handle one single case. Because everybody feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those like were the best of the best. Those were the companions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They had no conflict. There were, there were no cases. So he, he, just, he just resigned. After two years, two and a half years, uh, as you know, uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq uh, fell ill and uh, his situation got really bad. And he told, he had the feeling that he's, he was not gonna make it. He had a feeling that he's gonna die. 
So what he wanted to do, he wanted to appoint a successor. So in case he passes away, uh, the, the, the Muslims will not uh, turn on each other. They will not have a conflict anymore. But he did not know who to appoint. So he gathered the companions and he asked him, he told them, elect few and choose from them. And they thought about it for some time and they couldn't reach a decision and they told Abu Bakr, why don't you give us guidance on who to succeed you if you pass away. And he told them, uh, give me a few days to make up my mind. And it was told that Abu Bakr al-Dharam called Abdul Rahman Naud, and he asked him, what do you think of Omar? So Abdul Rahman Naud said, he's one of the best, but he is too harsh. And Abu Bakr said, he is too harsh because I am too soft. We complete each other. You know? And he also talked to other Sahaba like Uthman ibn Affan, and Uthman ibn Affan told him that Omar is too strict. Uh, he told him that he shows roughness, but inside he has he has a gentle soul and he has a gentle heart. So after after some thinking, uh, Abu Bakr al-Dhan decided to uh, to uh, 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 choose Omar as a successor, and he told Uthman to write a covenant and to read it in front of people, in which he did. Uh, there's a lot of details into that. I'm not going to go into those, that, those details. Uh, what had what, what ended up happening is that they read this in front of people. People pledge allegiance to Omar, and three days later, uh, Abu Bakr al Siddiq passed away, and Omar became Khalifa. One thing to note that Omar al Khattab was the first Khalifa to be uh, named Amir al Mu'mineen, because the Sahaba used to tell him, You are the Khalifa uh, of, uh, of the Khalifa. And he told him, Well, if I pass away, then the person next to me is going to be the Khalifa of the Khalifa of the Khalifa. And that, that's going to be confusing. And they told him, well, what do you want us to call you? And he thought about it and said, well, you are Muminun, right? And I'm your, like, you're Amir, your prince. So call me Amir al Muminin, meaning in Arabic, the prince of Muminin. And, and that was his, his name. And then that name was handed over to people uh, who succeeded the Amr al-Khattab, uh, radiallahu anhu. Um, during the, the, the Khilafah of Omar, big events took place and it was handled in a very uh, precise and decisive manner. Uh, one of the events that happened is the conquest of uh, the event, what's called, what's known as like Syria, Palestine area. And what happened is that the conquest started during the era of Abu Bakr, but then Abu Bakr passed away and it continued during the, the era of Omar al-Khattab And the first thing Omar al-Khattab did is he removed Khalid al Walid from, from the, 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 the general commissioner of the army. He had, he had complete control of the army and he removed him because every battle Khalid al Walid fought, he won, and Muslim uh, had fitna. They became infatuated with Khalid al Walid, his personality. And he did not want them to be infatuated with Khalid, so he removed him. And what he did, he sent an order to Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah. He told him, uh, remove Khalid and take, take over the leadership. It was told that Abu Abayn al saw the, 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 the book, but he was he did not want to go through it, with it. And he waited till after the siege of uh, Sham. Some people say it happened during the, during the Battle of Fihr. It's, it's unknown. But Abu Abayn ended up taking over uh, Khalid's, Khalid's place. It was one of the big events that, that happened. Uh, another event that happened is the year of uh, Ramada and uh, the plague uh, of Amwas. So this happened around the year 18 Hijri, uh, 639 AD. And what happened is that there was no rain in the peninsula for quite some time. It was really hot, there was no crop, and people started to, uh, there was a big famine. And this followed the year of Ramada. Ramada meaning everything is great because everything was grayish. No water, no crop, nothing. So that was called the year of Ramada, Am Ramada. And uh, what happened is that uh, Omar sent uh, uh, his messenger, messengers to uh, Abu Musa al Ash'ari in Basra. Uh, he told him about the situation, and 
what ended up happen, happening is Abu Musa al-Ash'ari sent a great caravan carrying wheat uh, and other food. He also sent uh, uh, to uh, Abu Ubaid al-Jarrah, uh, called him about the famine, and uh, he sent 4,000 camels carrying food to, to Medina. So there was, there was a little relief uh, with this. And uh, we all know the plague of Amras, they took the lives of 25,000 uh, Muslims including some of the big Sahabas, like Abu Ubaid al-Jarrah and Ma'ad al-Jabal. It was, it was disaster, and uh, one of the stories that it's told that uh, Umar al-Khattab, he used to love Abu Ubaid al-Jarrah, and when he heard about the, uh, the, 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 the plague, he sent for Abu Ubaid and told him, I want you back in Medina. But Abu Ubaid, I remember the hadith of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, if, if a plague hits the city, do not leave it, and do not allow anybody to enter it. So he listened and he obeyed to, uh, to the words of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He refused the order and he stayed and, and he passed away. Uh, one of the other major events is the conquest of Egypt and the conquest of Tripoli, uh, the conquest of Morocco. They all fell under, under the ruling of the Muslim state. During the era of uh, Umar al-Khattab, the, the Islamic state became so huge and so big that it almost went into chaos because there was great expansion and there had to be some kind of like, uh, Omar had to establish some kind of effective administrative, uh, administrative organization to keep uh, the state coherent and to keep it in unity. And what this led is that this led to the establishment of several important facilities uh, that Arabs were not, were not aware about uh, as a result. Uh, also, Omar al-Dawan, what he did, he, uh, he, uh, during his era, he made an expansion and restoration to the Grand Mosque in Medina and uh, to, the pro uh, to the Grand Mosque in Mecca, I'm sorry, and uh, to the Prophet's Mosque in Medina because to accommodate the, 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 new, the newcomers to Islam. Um, also, some of the accomplishments of Prophet of, uh, of, uh, Omar al-Khattab al-Dawan is that uh, he divided the, the, the conquered regions into five large regions, and each region was divided into a sub-region. For example, Iraq was divided into three regions, uh, Persia was divided into five or six regions, and each region was assigned uh, a ruler, uh, a wali, on it. So, and uh, this made it more, more, more independent, but it also follows Khilafah. But decisions that had to be made that are beneficial to the people of this region, they were taken. But the allegiance was to the Khilafah also. So the, 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 the Wali did not have to wait uh, and send you know, messenger and get a response from Abu uh, Sayyidina Omar if it was, if it was like a local matter. What uh, is also very famous about uh, the Khilafah of Omar is what we call the establishment of Dawawin. Uh, a Diwan in Arabic means like the house of record. So Sayyidina Omar uh, established uh, houses of records. So there was a house, uh, and this was done around the year 15 to 28 uh, after Hijrah. Uh, for example, he established something called Diwan al uh the record of Insha, which is like uh, uh, the record of messages, the, the messengers. All these messages were, were in like a house of records, organized. He established something called uh, al Ata, which is the financial institute to organize the finances of, of the estate. Uh, he established the Diwan of Jun. Jun means uh, military. So he had a house of record that included the name of all the soldiers, uh, their pay, their benefits, uh, all of that was recorded, uh, which was very, very amazing uh, in that time. We're talking about, you know, like 20 years after Hitler. Before that, they didn't even know how to read. So it was, it was, it was a, a, a big jump. Um, also, what uh, Omar al did is uh, he organized the army. So what he did, he assigned 4,000 knights to each region. So he ended up having about 32,000 knights. And he ended up, that, 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 that's excluding uh, infantry and uh, volunteers. And he assigned soldiers salaries. So it became uh, a profession as, as, as well. 
And uh, one of the things that Umar Khattab did is he issued an order for the soldiers. He mandated that soldiers know how to, you know, the art of, of horse riding. He, he insisted that they learn how to swim and to fight barefoot. He also introduced new weaponry uh, uh, for the war, like uh, uh, siege weaponry, like uh, siege towers, tanks, rams. And he introduced those. Of course, he, he got those from the, the Romans and the Persians, but he integrated that within the Muslim army as, as well. Uh, another thing is that he, uh, he adapted the first uh, Muslim coin, and he, had, he uh, added inscription to the coin. Uh, one of the things said, like, uh, there's no deity but God on, on, the, on the coin. Um, as far as uh, police also, uh, Umar al-Khattab established what is known as jail right now. And this was established to hold people accused of crimes. Before that, they would like isolate like or assign a small section of the masjid for those offenders and put them in it. But uh, Umar al-Khattab now he established the first jail uh, in Islam. Not only that, but he assigned people to patrol the streets of, uh, of Medina uh, to make sure that the citizens are safe. And he, he assigned them salaries also. Just imagine the mentality of this, of this person, how, 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 you know, the vision he had. I mean, things that he did, we do, we do today. It's amazing. Uh, as far as the judiciary system, you know, when, 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 when the state was small, you know, Khalifa used to be the judge, and he used to judge a few people, but as things got bigger, and, you know, so many people joined Islam, and the region became huge, Umar uh, al-Khattab, uh, he started to assign judges to different regions, and he assigned the judge. Each judge had a, had a, a very good salary to prevent them from, from taking briberies. And he used to always inspect them and make sure that, that they are following the Sunnah and the Quran. And he made the judiciary system uh, independent of the Khilafah. So the Khalifa cannot override the judge's decision anymore. That's one of the accomplishments he made. Um, there's so many accomplishments in his in his life that I mean I can go on for like days talking about this. But one of the sad events that happened is the assassination of Umar al-Khattab al-Dilan. It happened in the year 614. Um, as you know, because of Omar, Persia collapsed and it was con conquered, and then there was this conspiracies to to get rid of Omar radiallahu anhu. And this conspiracy uh, came into action in the year 644, uh, and uh, uh, where uh, Prophet uh, or Sayyidina Omar was uh, stabbed six times uh, uh, with a uh, dagger that was laced with poison uh, during the Fajr prayer, and uh, that that caused him to to uh, to, to pass away. It was told that. Uh, Abu Nur al Majusi, who did the assassination, uh, the Muslims, when they went to the prayer, they did not have their weapons on them. It wasn't a, it wasn't a state of war. They, they did not have weapons. They did not have their swords. When this happened, they tried to to capture Abu Nur, and the dagger was poisoned, and he was told that he attacked 13 of the Sahabis, uh, of whom six were killed also. And then the suddenly, they, finally, they, tried, they, they almost subdued him. But when he realized that the game, the game was over, he stabbed himself and killed himself and committed suicide. So the real motive for his action is still like vague, unknown, because when he died, his secret died with him. Um, when, before Sayyid Omar, uh, before he passed away, he, uh, he consulted his, uh, his followers uh, about who is going to, to succeed him. Again, he wanted to follow the footsteps of Abu Bakr of the Lawan. And he uh, uh, elected six people, and he, he elected, I think, six people. He told them, you know, you elect one of these six. I think the candidates were Uthman ibn Affan, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, uh, Az Zubair ibn Al Awwam, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, and Sa'id ibn Abi, uh, uh, Sa'id ibn Qas. And they, they settled on uh, Uthman ibn Abi Talib. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, and uh, uh, Sayyid Omar, when, when, after he died, he asked to be, to be buried next to Prophet Muhammad. He, uh, he took the permission of Aisha uh, anha, and he was buried next to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And this is where he did, where he, he resides uh, right now. So he was the companion of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, during his lifetime. 
and he was the companion of Muhammad uh, after his death. You know, so we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to accept him uh, a good acceptance. Uh, he was he's one of the ten people that were promised paradise, uh, mashallah, by Prophet Muhammad. Uh, peace, peace be upon him. Uh, one thing I wanted to say before I, I, I conclude is that Quran supported the opinion of Omar in more than one situation. Uh, and to the point where some Sahabas were saying, sometimes we think that an angel speaks on behalf of Omar because a lot of situations, his opinion was supported by the Quran. Uh, uh, one, of, one, of, one of them is that once Omar al-Khattab told Prophet Muhammad, because uh, uh, the wives of Prophet Muhammad did not, did not wear uh, hijab at the time, and he told Prophet Muhammad, may I suggest that your wives put burqa or hijab so the disbelievers will not see them and harm them. And after he said that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Quran supporting his opinion. Uh, he also, when they captured the, uh, the prisoners of war in the Battle of Badr, uh, they didn't know what to do with the prisoners of war. Uh, and the Abu Bakr, when Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, asked Abu Bakr uh, about his opinion, Abu Bakr told, well, there are brothers and, and cousins that just, you know, take fidya and cut them loose. But the opinion of Omar said, no, we should kill them because this will set an example. And Prophet Muhammad peace be was of the opinion of letting him, let, let, letting him go and not kill him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supported the opinion of Omar bin Khattab uh, in the Quran that they should have killed him because Prophet Muhammad did not have a strong uh, hold at the time. So you need to show strength. And then once you show strength, your enemies know who you are, then you negotiate. So those are some of the things uh, that Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab uh, did and accomplished. Uh, I try to be as, as brief as possible and uh, I pray for God subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to, to reward us for this, for this uh, uh, you know, meeting inshaAllah. Thank you very much.